selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to do we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash audioboom, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash audioboom now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash audioboom. Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We're your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. Happy New New Year, Year, weirdos. weirdos! Welcome to episode number 114 of History for Weirdos. The first episode of 2024. Yes, and if, you, if you're if you watching this and not listening to it, mm-hmm. or doing both preferably, mm-hmm. you'll notice that we are in a kitchen, or what looks like a kitchen, and that is because we are in a hotel room. <laughs> We're yes. actually recording this on New Year's Eve mm-hmm. for the new year. Yep. In between uh, get-togethers with friends, we are sitting in this hotel room to bring you all the very first episode of the year. Yes, I've already had a couple drinks, so this should be a really interesting episode. Thankfully, though, it is not my week. Yes. (laughs) Thankfully. I'm sure many of you would prefer it maybe just because of my state, but... (laughs) That's a good point. Yes. It is my week, and I don't drink, so this is appropriate. Thank God. It's your week. (laughs) So, Stephanie, without further ado, what do you have for us in the new year? Today, we are going to be talking about Queen Victoria and her killer wet nurse. Killer? Like, she was a great wet nurse? (laughs) No. Unfortunately, (laughs) killer in the traditional sense. Oh, wow. But not traditional killer wet nurse. I don't think that's a tradition, right? It's not a tradition, no. Okay. For good reason. And we will see why. (laughs) So it's going to be an interesting episode for sure. We, this is weird in the not so great way. Ooh. Um, and I promise, even though it's a, a wet nurse that commits murder, it's not too gruesome. I skip the gory details. You'll learn the whole story, but you don't need to hear the icky stuff if you don't like that. Okay. And that's probably for the best. This is probably for the best. <laughs> We're starting the new year on a bright note, aren't we? I was like, you know what? Let's start things off positive and hopeful. (laughs) I picked this topic for some reason. Yes, I'm so happy. Well, before I tell you about this wet nurse, this very infamous wet nurse, I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about Queen Victoria and the Victorian era. Nice. So Victoria was born at Kensington Palace. I'm sure you've heard of it. I know Kensington Palace. In London on May 24th, 1819. Yeah. She was the only daughter of Edward, the Duke of Kent, and he was the fourth son of George III. Wow. So he was the fourth son. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So that means he was not expecting to be the monarch then. Yeah. Victoria's father died shortly after her birth, actually. And she became heir 
oh. to the throne because her three uncles who preceded her in the line of succession had no surviving legitimate children. Okay, this is so weird. Yeah. She was the only surviving heir. Wow. So it skipped a bunch of people and went to her. Wow. So, okay. So a bunch of people in her family didn't have kids and then she made up for all of them, I believe. Right. Yep. She had like a million children. Yeah, exactly. We're going to be getting into that actually in a little bit. <laughs> and guys, when I say a million, I mean, not literally a million, just to be perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> we were all really concerned. Okay. So Queen Victoria is often remembered as one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history as she was queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland from June 20th, 1837 until she died in 1901. Wow. That's a long time. Her reign was 63 years and 216 days. Jeez. Very long reign. Longer than any of her predecessors. Right. And only Elizabeth II lasted longer, right? Mm-hmm. I actually touch on that in a little bit too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just spoiler after spoilers here. You're reading my mind <laughs> oh pretty my much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and of course, as we know, her reign is known as the Victorian era. It's the Victorian era. Named after her. And the fun fact that I have here is that Queen Elizabeth um, II was Victoria's great, great granddaughter. And in 2015 is when she totally outdid Victoria as the longest reigning uh, British monarch in history. And then the, the here's where the tea gets hot. When I was looking this up, um, Prince Philip, her husband, was also Queen Victoria's great, great grandchild. Oh. They were third cousins. I mean. And then they were also second cousins once removed via another uh, family member. Oh, wow. So they got the double whammy going. They got double cousins, basically. I mean, I know like legally, like that's fine. It's just kind of weird. Their whole fam. What's weird to me is when, you know, I was looking this up, their whole family tree. um, If you look up like illustrations of it, it's like a maze. Like things are connecting that maybe shouldn't connect so often. (laughs) Oh my God. So that's just a little fun uh, fact on the side. All right. So we're back in the Victorian era. This was like the time for industrial hustle, Mm -hmm. economic boom, and scientific progress. We're thinking big names like Charles Dickens and Charles Darwin. They're doing their thing. So the Charleses are on point. Yeah, the Charleses are on point in the Victorian era. And on the outside, I think it really looked just like an empire that was prospering. Um, But hey, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There's also Jack the Ripper doing his horror show, doing his thing, I guess. (laughs) Hey, he's just doing his thing. He's just doing his thing. Is it like eviscerating people, like innocent people? Yes. Yes. But, you know, he's doing his thing. And, of course, there were also the really grim... uh, horrors and truths of the Crimean War at this time. Oh, I always forget about that war. Yeah. Overall, the era is in and of itself a bit of a wild ride with a lot of contradictions, which I know we've touched on before on Mm -hmm. this podcast, but I just kind of wanted to set the scene for the world that we're in for this story. And just really cool. I, I always loved this saying for some reason. At Queen Victoria's death, it was said that Britain had a worldwide empire on which the sun never set. Yes, and we hear that, like, constantly. Yeah, that's so interesting. So in addition to her regal achievements, Andrew, what you were getting at, Queen Victoria was also known for having babies. She had a lot of children. A lot of babies. Uh, Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, were very famously known as a love match, which was not common. You know, it's not common with royal families. Typically, marriages are out of convenience, not out of romance. Right, out of like a sense of duty and like, oh, this makes, this is a good political match. Yeah, political match is a better way of putting it. It's strategic. It's strategic, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, But these two loved each other and their love made a lot of kids. (laughs) They had, let me see here, nine children. Okay, nine. That's, I mean, still less than your Abwe. Abwe technically gave birth to 10. Yes, that's true. But she raised nine. (laughs) 
And they had five girls and four boys with 17 years in between the oldest and the youngest. Wow. So they were just busy. They were busy. Apparently people who attended to them were like, yeah, they were busy. Okay. (laughs) We all heard it. (laughs) (laughs) No, like for real, right? Yeah. Yeah. They were known for, you know, what the thing you not got to do to make babies. (laughs) 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 So let me tell you who their kids were really quickly. There was Princess Victoria, a.k.a. Vicky, who was said to be her dad's favorite, Prince Albert's favorite. There was Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, a.k.a. Bertie. So cute. That's his nickname, Bertie? Bertie. Like Bert and Ernie. Oh, got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there was Princess Alice, Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Helena, Princess Louise, Prince Arthur, Duke of Connaught. He was said to be Queen Victoria's favorite. Ooh. (laughs) Prince Leopold and Princess Beatrice. Oh my God. That was a lot. (laughs) There's a lot of them. I already forgot of them, to be honest with you. (laughs) There was too many. (laughs) So many kids and so many titles and locations associated with their names let me ask you a question Mm -hmm. when you have that many kids do you think you might like forget one like here and there like every once in a while so that's so funny because there's this thing that my abuela is famous for who raised nine kids as we just said is she'll be trying to speak to one of her children like say she's trying to talk to my mom whose name is ada she'll go evelia leticia margarita Mirna, like <laughs> she just starts naming them all until she gets the right one. <laughs> she just goes through a full cycle. She just goes through all of them. And then finally, ah, Ada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she loves that. My mom? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's her favorite. <laughs> My mom's the youngest of nine. Yeah, so she gets the, the gambit, the full gambit. Yes. So I bet, I bet every once in a while you forget some stuff that's going on. You've got to forget a birthday. There's too many. You you forget their middle name, something like that, right? Like there's so many kids to keep track of. Um, and actually we're going to get into a little bit of her child rearing here. So she was pretty involved in taking care of Vicky, the eldest, mm-hmm. which makes sense. It's the firstborn. And then a little bit less so with Bertie. That's the future king, actually, Albert. Um And then as her family just kept growing, and of course, your responsibilities as a monarch don't let up, she spent less time directly overseeing the care of her kids. Later in life, she admitted to Vicky, her eldest daughter, in letters that she would only check in on them directly probably once every three months. Oh my God. God, that's terrible. Like like one-on-one time, once every three months. So she might have been like a good monarch. Maybe not the best mother, though. I really wonder, and we just have always had such different expectations of mothers and fathers, right? Because I don't think most kings, Western kings that we think of were good oh, fathers. Terrible. I'm so, guessing, like, I mean, Henry VIII was awful, I mean, I'm sure we already know that. We already know that. But I mean, like he had no redeeming qualities, even as a father. But think um, a really good example would actually be not a king, but Marcus Aurelius. Oh, he was not a good father. Really wise, philosophical, a great leader, but obviously not a great dad. I'm really honored and amazed that you brought up like ancient Rome. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Did that just for you, babe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. But that's a really like... All jokes aside, that's actually a really good example. Mm-hmm. I just wonder if it's even possible to run an empire and be a good parent at the same time. You know what? If you ever do that, yeah. you should write a book about it. If any weirdos listening have run an empire while <laughs> raising children, you let us know. Yeah, I'm genuinely <laughs> curious. <laughs> so since Queen Victoria was so busy having a million kids, like you said, and overseeing an empire... Um, She used a wet nurse for all of her children, which was totally normal among royals. In Western Europe, wealthy and noble families would often employ wet nurses because breastfeeding actually requires a lot of time. It's like a full-time job. And you have to, when you're not breastfeeding, you're like constantly eating and drinking water because it takes so much energy from you. 
and obviously Queen Victoria couldn't do that. And if a woman isn't breastfeeding, um, she'll get her menstruation back. She'll get her period back and she's fertile again. So in noble families and royal families, you can imagine why that's so important, right? You need to get back to making heirs as soon as possible. And they did. And Victoria they, and Albert, they really did. They really did. Um, but for those that may be wondering what exactly is a wet nurse. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> a wet nurse is a lactating woman who breastfeeds. Um, so that's going to be a mom who had a baby probably around the same time as you. And she's breastfeeding her baby, but also breastfeeding your baby. Wow. As a job. So Queen Victoria's wet nurse for Prince Albert, Bertie, mm-hmm. was a woman by the name of Mary Ann, Mary Ann Burrow. And she was born roughly in 1811. She would have come from pretty humble means, working class woman. And it looks like she likely got the job as wet nurse because her husband, George, also worked for the royal family. He worked on the grounds. Um, he had assumed or inherited a position of his father's. And so he kind of got her foot in the door that way. And she would have nursed Prince Albert, I think, for about eight to ten months. Oh, wow. Until, and I think it would have been typical to nurse for about a year. And then one day she was randomly let go. And no one knew why, like no one from the outside, right? I'm sure uh, Queen Victoria and her husband knew, but she was just let go randomly. And after that, she settles down in a cottage in what is known as West Escher. That's the region with her husband, George. Okay. And then after she's let go, she has her second daughter. So she was wet nursing because she'd had her first child. Then she has her second daughter, who was born in 1843. So that's around the time that we're at here. And then very shortly after, she has five more children, one right after another. Wow. Okay. So she's following in Victoria's steps, it seems like. She was inspired by the queen there. (laughs) Yeah. And I wrote in my notes as I was researching this, oh my God, I'm tired just thinking about that. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I can imagine. That's a lot of kids. So she she had... um, Seven kids total, Mary Ann Burrow. Okay. Wow. This episode is brought to you in part by BetterHelp. Weirdos, it's a brand new year. That means making New Year's resolutions or setting goals. I know one of the goals that I wanted to set last year was going to therapy. And over the course of about 10 months, it has helped immensely. I've definitely benefited from therapy, and I think really anyone can benefit from therapy. It can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything moving forward. If you're thinking of starting therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and is suited to your schedule. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And the great thing is you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Now, find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash HFW today to get 10% off your very first month. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash history for weirdos. So now we're going to get to the more horrific part of this story. Lovely. Let's go. (laughs) So let's set the scene. It's a Saturday morning on June 10th, 1854, and two men, one named Mager and one named Peasley, these are their surnames, are strolling past the Burrow uh, residence. I'm sorry, I think I said her last name was Burrow, but I think it's Bruh is how you would pronounce it. Gotcha. Okay. Bruh. So they're strolling past Marianne's home in Escher. 
and suddenly they spot a bloody pillow just chilling in the window of someone's home Uh uh-oh talk about a red flag literally just just see like a bloody pillow thankfully they don't ignore this like very strange situation and they rally some other neighbors to investigate so they get into the house and it turns out that mary ann um who is about 43 at this time is in the house with a nasty throat wound and she cannot talk but sadly that's not all six of her kids also have slashes in their throats oh my god all the kids who are injured are deceased and mary ann is clinging to life she's bleeding to death So the folks on the scene quickly get her to a doctor and everyone's wondering like who would do this to a mother and her children who would just slit their throats like that. But the doctor miraculously almost is able to kind of like sew her up um, and she's able to still use her vocal cords. And as soon as she can speak, she confesses to murdering her children and saying that she also attempted to kill herself. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. That's the big, big question that everyone was wondering. Yeah. I'll just really briefly uh, name the kids here. The children were Georgiana, her second daughter, who was 11, William, age eight, Carrie, age seven, Harriet, and Henry, who were four year old twins, and little George, who was somewhere between one and two years old. The Different sources said different ages, Mm -hmm. but somewhere between one and two. So she had a one-year-old to an 11-year-old deceased at this point. So as mentioned, she confessed to the murders, but the cops and everyone else were confused. So they were digging into things a bit more. And they started connecting the dots, seeing that Marianne's world was unraveling a bit before this tragedy. Okay. So on June 6th, which would have been four days before she did the unthinkable, her husband, George, walked out on them. Mm, Okay, I was just about to ask, where is this, her husband during Mm -hmm. all of this? Apparently, George had suspicions that Mary was stepping out on him. Oh, snap. And guess what? He had... He had receipts. Oh. He hired a private investigator to follow her around. And he reported back that on May 29th, so a few days before, people spotted Mary leaving a London tavern with some mystery man. And they ended up at what can only be described as a, quote, questionable house. Questionable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think in the Vic- Victorian era, a woman walking into a home alone with a man who is not her husband was enough of a sign that she was cheating apparently. Cause that's literally the only evidence that the private investigator gets. And the next day that George receives this information, he loses it on Marianne. He leaves her and he says that he is going to fight to get custody and take all of their kids away from her. Oh snap. So it's not looking good. No, that's not looking good at all. And then something else to consider here, something that's uncovered during the investigation, is that right after George leaves and makes the threat about the kids, all the kids catch measles. They get sick. Okay. Pretty common disease at that time. It's really terrible. And at this time, it could definitely prove fatal to have measles. And according to Mary's later reports to the police, she was caring for the kids all alone. She didn't have anyone helping her. Mm -hmm. They were up all night crying. Everyone's sick and feverish. And Mary had not slept in days. Oh, so you think this could have just been a psychotic break? It's possible. I want to hear what you think for sure when I'm done. She was stricken with really severe headaches. And she began, she remembers beginning to contemplate death by suicide. She was later quoted saying, there was something like a cloud over my eyes. I thought I would go down, get a knife 
and cut my throat. Then there are descriptions of the scene and kind of like what happened, what she did to her kids, but I just wanted to leave that out because no one wants those images in their heads. If you want to look it up, it's easy to find. Um, but a little while after this sort of cloud was over her head, she wakes up and she sees her children drenched in blood and she tries to yell for help but she cannot because she has cut her own throat and she realizes in that moment what she has done. Oh my God. So she, it's not like she's like one of those crazy people that's like, Oh no, I did it. Like, like the voices told me to do it and everything. It seemed like she like, immediately regrets or like, Oh my like Lord savior Satan told me like is like totally cool with this. Yeah. Or even when you hear terrible cases, even today about people who harm their their children their family trying to justify like it was better for them for us to be together right she doesn't say anything like that um it seems when you know she describes she has memory of what she did to her kids but it almost sounds like she's in a fugue state yes i was just about to say that like it sounds like she's like watching herself kind of do that and then passes out after cutting her throat and then wakes up and is horrified yeah rightfully so so horrified that mm. I think, I know this is kind of a dark thought, you guys, but I feel like in this time period, you really could get away with murder because they have such little forensics. Right, she could. I mean, her own throat was slit, so she could have just said like, oh. It was an attacker. Exactly. She could have gotten away with it easily, I feel like. But she confesses immediately. She feels so terrible. Yeah. So I think that's something to consider, right? So when she realizes that she cannot scream for help, the first thing she thinks of is to grab one of the bloody pillows and put it in the window, hoping that it attracts attention. And it does. And it does. Um, I also want to note that during the investigation, and I mean, you could take this with a grain of salt, but Marianne's neighbors described her as a really good mother. Oh. For example, one of uh, her neighbors named Sarah Weller said that Mary was, quote, very kind to her children, almost too kind. (laughs) Oh. Ironic. Very ironic. And then um, one of the men who discovered her was a neighbor as well. And he said, quote, she always appeared to be very good and very kind to her children. And even the local constable was familiar with her. And he said, quote, I considered her as good a mother as ever lived. Mm. So again, you could take that with a grain of salt. We never really know our neighbors, but the people in her community were very, very shocked. Like no one would have expected this. So then we're going to fast forward a little bit. We're going from June to August. It's August 8th. And Mary has recovered from her injuries and she's standing trial for the murder of her children. The defense's argument here is insanity. It's a good defense, honestly. They called an expert alienist, which was a psychiatrist. That's what they called them. An alienist. An alienist. That's amazing. I know. It sounds like a cooler job. Like you study the psychiatry or the psychology of aliens. Hell yeah. (laughs) That would be really cool. (laughs) I would want that job. Is that just me? No, that sounds pretty legit. Yeah, that's so cool. That'd definitely be you, though. But anyway, he has nothing to do with aliens. (laughs) It's just like a mental health expert at the time. (laughs) His name was Forbes B. Winslow. Forbes B. Winslow here. Forbes B. Winslow. And he testified on Marianne's behalf... But his argument's kind of like, to me, kind of (laughs) dumb. He said his main argument is that Marianne must have been insane because women's maternal instinct would make it impossible for a not insane mother to kill her offspring. Okay. Yes, that's dumb, but only in modern context. I feel like people back then would be like, yes, that absolutely makes sense. Like, I could see that. Yeah. I wish that were true. Oh, no. No, I just mean, unfortunately, people do harm their children. Yeah. I wish that were, like, facts. It's just kind of like him being like, she's a woman. Of course not. Yeah. Oh, she's a woman. I don't know why we're talking with the transatlantic accent (laughs) when they're Victorian age uh, (laughs) British people, but... 
It sounds old timey. So yeah, it's, old, it's basically the the farthest old timey voice we have. Yes. Um, however, I will say that I think there is a good argument here for insanity. She was sleep deprived. She was really stressed. Like not just be, like her kids are sick with something that could kill them already. Not like s- sick now when. I'm sure parents listening know this. Anytime your kid gets sick, you're just like really stressed because they're in pain and they're suffering. But this is like actually very scary. And then something that I thought about, which they would not have really considered back then, is if her youngest child, George, I believe, was one, Mm -hmm. she would still be in the um, time frame of being susceptible to postpartum psychosis which can be triggered by extreme stress and sleep deprivation. Very interesting. So it's possible she did have kind of like a psychotic break there um, and was not seeing things clearly. I think that's very possible. But at the end of the day, it was just her and her kids, so we don't know. Right. And maybe this mystery man... Oh my gosh, you're just throwing that in there. Stir in the pot. <laughs> Stir in the pot, baby. <laughs> you think like the mystery man was trying to get rid of her and her kids? Exactly. Wow. Because it was all a psyop. That's interesting because they did bring up her freaking husband <laughs> testified against her that obviously since he's basically like, obviously since she was cheating on me, she's a bad person. So, of course, she would kill her kids. But he didn't say anything about, like, as a mom, she was really harsh or she hated the kids or she made threats. He was like, she cheated on me, of all people. (laughs) So, he was just really hurt and lashing out. Yeah, really, really hurt. Um, So, they were, the other side was trying to really make, paint this picture of some immoral woman who was trying to get rid of her kids and run off with uh, another guy, but... Her attempting to harm herself doesn't really line up with that. No, that's... And it wasn't just like a superficial wound either. It sounded like... I mean, she cut her vocal cords or at least hurt them. Yeah, that sounds really bad. It's rough. So although, as I mentioned, Mary Ann confessed multiple times. She just kept being like, yeah, that was me. Yeah, I did it. And it was terrible and I feel terrible and I don't know what to do. Um, Even though she did that. And then the judge openly advised the jury to find her guilty... Okay, I feel like that doesn't really, you don't really do that in What court. is the point of a jury then if you're going to do stuff like that? Yeah. The jury still uh, returned with the verdict of not guilty. Oh, by reason of insanity? By reason of insanity. Nice. Yeah, so they seem to believe that argument as well. So unsurprisingly, the news of this was like sensational, like spread really fast, particularly because her association with the Royal family. Mm, That makes sense. And what is so silly to think about, but uh, was definitely a belief at this time was that wet nurses needed to be very virtuous women because it was believed that they could pass on traits to the baby that they were feeding right like oh like he'll pick up some of my personality because i'm feeding him it is a very intimate thing to do but that i don't think that's a thing and so of course people were having a field day that this woman who murdered her children did probably the most unforgivable thing you can do breastfed the future king right and so people were losing it It's funny. People have thought this for thousands of years. I know like in ancient Spartan society. They thought that as well. Yeah. Especially, Mm -hmm. well, a little, and even a little interesting twist is that they would want like the men and woman, uh, when they're, you know, coupling and procreating Mm -hmm. to be happy. Yeah. So not only like healthy and physically fit and, and which like uh, in science kind of like actually validates that today, Mm -hmm. but like actually like being happy. Because that would pass on to the baby. Exactly. That's really funny because I don't, I think I've told you this. um, In Mexico, a lot of people, like if you see a cute baby or something, like a really 
particularly beautiful baby, you'll be like, wow, you two must have made that baby with a lot of love. <laughs> You're like, like it's a sign. <laughs> it's seen as a sign that the couple was very in love. That's kind of cute. Yeah. So there is this interesting belief here about things getting passed down that probably isn't true, right? Yeah, probably not, but... But because of Who this, knows? of course, everyone was like freaking out. Like, what is this going to do to the like little birdie? And this is wild. She was in the royal family's home and she was a murderer. Oh my gosh, birdie. What is going to happen to you, buddy? I know. I know. And then, of course, the news does reach, obviously, Queen Victoria. Um, it made her think of her son. Right. And Queen Victoria recorded in her diary regarding this case, quote, a most awful and horrid tragedy has taken place at Escher. Mrs. Bruh, for eight months, Bertie's wet nurse, has murdered her six children. The news quite haunts one. She was, it seems, a most depraved woman. Morose, ill-tempered, and stupid she always used to be when in our house. End quote. So I think we know why she got fired. Oh, so she was dumb. <laughs> she was dumb. Apparently, she was morose, ill-tempered, and stupid. That's not a great combination. So, okay, that's, I guess, mystery solved. Mystery solved as to <laughs> why she lost her employment. Yeah. And even though Marianne was found not guilty, that doesn't mean she was free to go. She was sentenced to life in a mental institution known as Bedlam. Ooh. Staff there noted that she was quiet, kind of kept to herself. And was nonviolent. That's what we know of her time there. She dies in Bedlam just eight years later after a series of strokes. I wonder if she just was just too sad to keep on going on. I can't imagine, you know, if she did not want to harm her children, if we are to believe that premise. And she experienced some sort of psychosis or f like fever or something. I can't imagine the trauma of that. Of waking up and realizing that you've done that. Every single day. I feel like you would just... I would do so much to your brain. Yeah. I think the strokes make sense somehow. That's my like pseudoscience. I'm like, yes, the two things are connected. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe just the mental trauma. Like, it has to take a toll. Mm-hmm. How could it not? Right. And then being in a mental hospital in the Victorian era is probably not the chillest vibe. I was going to say, that's not... It's not going to be a good time. I don't think so. A good time was had by none in that I, place. I agree. Um, unfortunately, I guess she becomes really famous though. While she's in there, she does do a few more interviews. That's how we have um, more snippets about like what was going on in the house. Again, didn't include that, but you can look it up. Um, she becomes so famous that the house where she murdered her kids became like a tourist attraction. Oh, of course it did. People love the, like the macabre. I agree. Especially in the Victorian era where they're yes. also so externally focused on propriety and looking civilized and being civilized. They're also so fascinated by this like icky underbelly of humanity. Yeah, that is really interesting. It's like a juxtaposition of like things that shouldn't go together, but they do. Yeah, yes. like especially like British and even um, American society at the time were very like like prim and proper. Mm -hmm. But there was like an obsession with like the occult, with like kind of the weird stuff. And then as well as, you know, obviously with like science, which was a little bit more mainstream. But it, it, these like especially like the occult and like kind of being like uptight yeah they do not go together you would think not but this actually what you just said reminds me of a previous episode that i did on the spiritualist yes the spiritualism was huge right huge during this time where you you know you think of like um a proper christian society wouldn't necessarily be trying to talk with ghosts or in spirits but people at this time loved that as well right but i i will say i think the fascination with true crime particularly such a gruesome unthinkable crime to me is actually is still a little surprising that these people were like yeah let's go see where she murdered her kids right you just wouldn't think of that from of people in like the 19th century i wouldn't want to do that today not no. for a crime like that no that's brutal that's particularly vicious that's awful to think about 
Um, but yeah, people were like hopping in there. I don't know. The, this is dope. Yeah, with popcorn and a little gift shop for all we know, <laughs> having a good time. Unreal. It also inspired, this case also inspired a poem called the Escher Tragedy. Because again, that's the mm. area that it took place in. It's a super depressing poem. So I did not include it in this episode. I'm glad. <laughs> but you can Google the Escher Tragedy poem if you want to. This was so big. It's wild to me that we don't hear more about it. Like... People could not stop talking about this. This was all over the paper. There were really unsettling like cartoons about it. Um, oh. It became very famous. And I've never heard of like, I don't know, you'd think there'd be like a, a TV drama or a movie or a book or something about this case. I mean, I had never heard of this until just now, basically. So mm -hmm. and that is surprising because it is such a particularly vicious case. Yes, and it was so impactful, I think, to the like community that even two decades after this crime, so Mary Ann is dead, like it's been two decades, in London, a wax museum recreated <laughs> the gruesome scene of the murders. Oh my God. In the scene, there's Mary Ann standing over her, her six dead children in a bloody night dress wearing a label on her that says, quote, this woman has nursed his Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, end quote. Not very tasteful entertainment, if you ask me. Not tasteful, but I'm sure they made a killing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> not a killing, not the pun. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you weren't trying to do that on purpose. I wasn't. No, that wasn't even on purpose. That makes it so much better. <laughs> I'm sure they made a killing off that they one. They made a killing. Oh my God. I can't believe. I, that's actually perfect. Wow. I'm really proud of myself for that pun. That was a subconscious pun moment right there. That was there. 100. I wish I could take credit and say, no, I definitely thought of that. No, it was subconscious. 100%. Oh my gosh. And that, my dear weirdos is the shocking, strange, and sad story of Queen Victoria's wet nurse, Mary Ann, and the murder of her children. I am so sorry. I don't have a happier note to end this on. I was trying to find some like weird, inspirational, uplifting angle, and I was like, you just got to own it, Steph. You just got to tell them this is sad. Yeah, life sucks sometimes, ch children. So, you know... <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> but yeah, that's the story of Marianne Burrow. Wow, thank you. I, again, no idea that this had happened. This mm -hmm. is really wild. It was, it's so strange. And I just, it's one of those cases where I, I think as I shared, I think the most likely situation is some form of psychosis. What do you think? That's what I was thinking too. I think that she just had a break. Like she snapped. Yeah. And then just did that all like right. it, like you said i think it and it, i think what you said about a fugue state mm -hmm. is 100 percent precise yeah because if you snap but you're very like like you're with it you're in the moment you're not disassociated you probably still i don't know i just think her confessing immediately and being really insistent on like no i did it like i'm guilty just like send me away type of thing makes me think she wasn't fully there when she committed the crimes right and also all the testimony from her neighbors saying that she was actually like a good mom she was too nice to her kids yeah like too ironically. sweet too lenient i know i know it's so sad but it's still you know they just didn't have the forensics uh to like recreate things in a way where we could have a better understanding they obviously didn't have the mental health knowledge about what can happen to moms with like the big hormonal changes and everything so it's wild it was a wild story yep particularly brutal and wild yay history for weirdos that's our new tagline <laughs> <laughs> brutal and wild <laughs> so before we wrap up i'm just going to briefly share my sources for this week okay um there's ranker.com that's where i found this story the first time I found this story a really long time ago, and it's been like at an, an open tab on my phone for forever. And I decided to just finally do it. Nice. Um, Thoughtco.com, National Institute of Health, 
the English Heritage Organization, History Channel, Royal Collection Trust, and Murderpedia. Oh, very nice. Not Wikipedia, but Murderpedia. There was no Wikipedia page on this, but there was Murderpedia. Of course. Yeah, you the true crime like community yeah i, I was like i was, I was gonna, yeah community yeah i was gonna say like uh aficionados but maybe community is better yeah they, they really they go hard with this stuff murderpedia is a really interesting you're resource. i consider you like a um like a a true crime person me not as much but i definitely think you are i think when i reflect on our podcast episodes thus far i've definitely covered murder the most yeah you've covered it more than i have for sure yeah Shout out to Danielle Starr, if she's listening, our friend who also thinks about murder all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I know she sometimes listens to this podcast. So hi. Hello. This there. one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, weirdos, that was our week's story. Thank you, Stephanie, for presenting. Again, third time saying this. I had no idea. And I really, I had no idea what this episode was going to be on. And I had never heard of this before. So that was really cool. I'm glad. I love story time. Yes, yes. I, I loved it when I was six, and I love it now at like 31. How Was this a fun story time with a couple drinks in you? Oh, absolutely. I'm really glad I wasn't sober for this. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, I'm so glad. <laughs> well, thank you so much, weirdos. Until next time. Until next time, weirdos. Adios and happy new year. Happy new year. Selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to do we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash audioboom, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash audioboom now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash audioboom. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help so you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.